Good morning. It's good to see all of you out this morning. I have a lot of friends and family here, and I'm so glad that all of you uh, get to be here for this this morning. Um, if you want to grab your Bibles, you can. I'm going to have all of the verses this morning up on the screen so you can save you from turning a little bit and save some time. Uh, but this morning, I, I hope to really accomplish two things. First, this morning, I want to give you a couple pieces of evidence that, that I think really demonstrate that the Bible is, in fact, inspired by God uh, and that there is a being that's outside of the natural and the material laws of this world, you know, one that it, he does not exist in time as we know it, this one must have written the Bible. I think it's the best explanation we have for the things that are contained in it. And secondly, uh, in light of this, in light of the, the fact that the, the scriptures are inspired, I hope to help us to actually do whatever it is that's written in them uh, because I think we'll find out this morning that it's for our good, it's for our benefit that we do these things. So read with me this verse this morning. This is uh, Bo, what Bo read, Deuteronomy chapter 10. Verse 12 reads, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in His ways and to love Him, to serve the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and to keep the Lord's commands and His statutes, which I am commanding you today, at the end Moses says, for your good. So I hope by the end of this morning that you're more convinced that the things uh, that are revealed to us in these scriptures are, in fact, just that, that they're, they're for your good, they're for my good, and, and that they're for the good of a society as a whole. And that if we were to begin to listen to these words and to start to love them, I think that we could find some much-needed healing uh, for our world today. And I hope also that as, uh, as people, Christian or not, uh, that we can all begin to see the profound wisdom that's revealed to us here this morning and so that we might start to pay the more careful attention to it. This morning we're going to start, we're going to look at what you might call uh, divine wisdom in the, in the Torah this morning, or we might know it as the first five books of the Bible, uh, specifically Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Within these five books, as with the rest of the Bible, is wisdom and knowledge that surpasses that of the common man. As Christians, we believe, as well as Jews, that God gave Moses revelation directly from heaven. The point is that Moses didn't sit around and think up all of the, uh, the laws and the commandments in the Old Testament in himself, but rather God spoke to Moses from heaven, revealing these things to him. So that's what I mean when I say divine wisdom found within these pages. pages. It's not something that the human intellect created, but it's something that, that had to come from God. Uh, there's no other way for man uh, to have known about it, at least in the time that it was revealed to man. So first example this morning, uh, this is going to be from the book of Leviticus chapter 13. In verse 18, Moses writes, And when someone has a boil on his skin, and it heals, and in the place where the boil was, a white swelling or reddish white spot appears, this man must present himself to the priest. The priest is to examine it, and if it appears to be more than skin deep, <clears throat> the, air, the hair in it has turned white, the priest shall pronounce him unclean. This is an infectious disease that has broken out where the boil was. If you drop down to verse 45, the person with such an infectious disease, this person must wear torn clothes, he must let his hair be unkempt, he must cover the lower part of his face and he must cry out, unclean, unclean. He must identify himself. As long as this person remains or has the infection, he remains unclean. Uh, he must live alone. He must live outside the camp. So this last part here is what I want to focus on for a second this morning. This, this man must live alone. This man must stay outside the camp. Do you guys recognize what this is? This is quarantining, isn't it? To protect against the spreading of disease. Well, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? Here, if the infectious person here in Israel remains inside the camp, then, then what happens? His disease is going to spread to everyone else, isn't it? But the word of God through Moses, mind you, over 3,500 years ago, tells this man to go and to live outside the camp until his disease is healed, and then he can come back in. So, so stop and think about that for a moment. 
what would you say is probably one of the most important things that we've done, you know, in, in light or in the wake of this coronavirus? You'd say quarantine, right? Well, how do you think that we knew how to do that? Who, who discovered this? Who, who, who thought of this? See, here's what's so divine or, or so miraculous, you might say, about this information. And this is, this is something that's helped to, you know, really strengthen. Should I wait on you? So this is something in particular that's really helped to strengthen my faith in the inspiration of the scriptures uh, is that Moses wrote this. I'm sorry, I just want to make sure. Definitely. Yeah. You muted it. That's all right. There we go. Okay, so, so back to this, this idea of quarantining, right? <clears throat> how do you think Moses knew exactly how to do that? Uh, who, who, who discovered this and who taught this to Moses? So here's what's so divine or, or so miraculous, you might say, uh, about the, the information here in the Scriptures. And this, again, like I said, this is something that's helped to really strengthen my faith in the evidence of the inspiration of the Scriptures is that, you know, Moses wrote this, this idea or this law of, of quarantine uh, in the law of the Jews around, around 1500 B.C. So, and this knowledge is not heard of anywhere in the ancient world for tens of hundreds of years. And I think we've only now really began to understand this idea of quarantining since here, even since modern times. You know, the fact that you stay home from work or the fact that you stay on one side of the house so you don't get your family sick, you know, it sounds so, so common sense to us today, doesn't it? But what I, what I hope we understand this morning is that Moses knew about this over 3,000 years ago, way before anyone else in the world had any idea. So let that sink in for a moment. That's, that's a pretty important piece of information to know for a group of people living in community, isn't it? Uh, so here's the question that, uh, that we have before us this morning. You know, was Moses perhaps a, a medical scientist, genius, you know, in his time, and he taught the people this, he discovered it for himself, he, he tried it and found that it worked, and so he kept doing it? Or is it possible that maybe there's a creator of the universe that was revealing these things to Moses, the useful and practical pieces of information for Moses to teach the Jews and then also to get out into the world. Because here's the thing, we know for sure that Moses wrote this down. We, we have the manuscripts, you can see them on the internet, you can see them in museums and libraries. Uh, scholars will tell us when the text was written. Uh, so we, we have to come up with an answer for this. How is it that Moses knew these things? In my judgment, of course, as I've already said this morning, divine revelation is the best answer for that. But just in case that you're not satisfied with that answer, let's explore uh, another possibility. Because we know that Moses spent some time in Egypt, did, didn't he? And Egypt was a pretty advanced civilization for that time. Uh, so maybe there's nothing miraculous here. Maybe Moses and his time in Egypt just learned about these things. And when he decides to carry the Jews through the wilderness to the promised land, he already knew this. Uh, there's, he didn't need God to reveal it to him because Egypt had already taught him. Because in Acts 7 and 22, we're taught that Moses was educated in all the wisdom and the learning of the Egyptians. And he was a man, in, uh, he was a man of power in words and deeds. Uh, so again, Moses learned this in Egypt. There's nothing really divine here, but not so fast. Thankfully, and interestingly enough, uh, history has been very kind to us in this matter, and so we're going to learn for just a minute what some things uh, about the time of Moses, what some things uh, were that were taught in Egypt. Yeah, so this right here, this is called the Ebers Papyrus. I know most of you probably don't know about this or haven't heard much about it. But anyways, it, it's an ancient Egyptian medical manuscript, uh, and scholars will date this manuscript to 1552 B.C., this is the, the textbook, if you will, uh, that Moses would, was or would have been educated with during his time in Egypt. So we're going to look real quick at a couple examples of some, some medical knowledge that, uh, that's found here within this manuscript. This manuscript reads that, you know, if you, uh, if you were to cut your hand, that you heal that cut by using worm's blood and mule dung, and you rub that into your cut and it will heal you. If you get a snake bite, your, your physician in Egypt would prescribe to you uh, to drink magic water that's been poured over a special idol, and that would cure you of your snake bite. Certain remedies found 
in this manuscript include mixing together things like the shell of a beetle, the guts of a goose, the tail of a mouse, and, and on and on that way. And I know that this may sound a little comical to us today, but we have to realize that at this time that this was written, Egypt was the pinnacle of, of knowledge and power and wisdom in, in the day. And, and so for them to uh, you know, have this kind of information in their law and in their, in their medicine textbook kind of tells us where the world was at this time. Uh, and so it would be like if you, if you were going to have brain surgery or something, you, you would go to the most well-respected, well-known, you know, prominent physician that you could find. So that would be like back in that day, traveling to Egypt to learn about your disease, and that's the kind of information that you would get. So think about this with, with me for a minute. How is it that Moses uh, grew up reading this textbook he leaves Egypt and heads into the wilderness, and there he decides to write down a law uh, that's going to govern and protect his people. And when he does, he writes in it something that completely flies in the face of the conventional wisdom at the time. Scholars who are you know, more knowledgeable than myself, of course, say that there's not one medical misconception in the law of Moses. And so, of course, you, know, you might have a different opinion about this, but in my mind, this helps us move towards the, uh, that these scriptures are really inspired. So let's do a quick review. In Leviticus 13, about 1500 B.C., within the law of Moses, uh, Moses is taught to tell the people that when there's an infection among the people, the first thing they're to do is to identify themselves. They're supposed to wear torn clothes. They're supposed to let their hair be unkempt. You would definitely notice a person that had the infection. He's supposed to have his hand over his mouth, and he's supposed to cry out, unclean, unclean, in order to help identify himself and to keep his uh, droplets and, and breath from going out to other people. And then that person's supposed to go and to live outside the camp. Okay? That's what, in 1500 B.C., that's what Moses was taught, I'll say, by God to tell the people to do. Meanwhile, in Egypt, they're using things like worm's blood and, and animal feces and, and beetle shells and, and mouse tails in all of their medicine. So here we can, we can kind of drastically see the difference between what the Jews were taught through Moses and then what the rest of the wisdom and the world was teaching at the time. So considered one of medicine's oldest practices, bloodletting, we're moving on to example two, bloodletting is thought to have originated in ancient Egypt. It then spread to Greece where physicians who lived in the third century uh, believe that an illness stemmed from an overabundance of blood. So remember, this is going to be 1,300 years after the time of Moses, that the standard of care in medicine, or the common thought in medicine, was that your disease is most likely caused because your body has too much blood. So guess what the cure was? Bloodletting. Cutting through an artery or a vein and draining your blood until you were cured from the disease. Any idea how that went for a lot of people? Well, we're going to look at at least one example this morning. So back in 1799, George Washington's physicians, and this is a quote from, from PBS.org, back in 1799, George Washington's physicians justified the removal of more than 80 ounces of his blood or 40% of his total blood volume. This massive blood loss could not have helped of course, among other things, could not have helped the president's dire condition. So even back in 1799, this practice was used on the first president of the United States. And granted, conditions were likely harsh in early America, but don't you think that the president would have sought out the best medical care, the best medical knowledge that he could have? Now, I don't know how many deaths occurred over human history due to this practice, but I can, I can just about surely say that Moses didn't participate in any of them. And the reason why I know that is because look at what Moses was taught in Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11 reads, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. See, God tells us here that when they were to eat an animal, that they were not to eat the blood of the animal with it because the blood was supposed to go on the altar, because God said it was the animal's life that counted for the sacrifice, 
And, and God taught Moses that that animal's life was in its blood. Now remember, Israel was given this information in 1500 B.C. Here's another quote. But it wasn't until, until a more thorough discovery of the circulation system by scientist William Harvey in about 1620 that science came around to say that biological life really is maintained in the blood, which brings both nourishment to all parts of the body and carries away its waste. So just imagine the number of human lives that could have been spared uh, with this information just, just sitting right here in the book of Leviticus waiting to be read. So again, Moses was taught by God in 1500 B.C., that uh, the life of the flesh uh, of humans and animals is found in their blood. And uh, over you know, 3,100 years later, science comes around to the conclusion that, yes, in fact, biological life really is in the blood. And there's more examples than this in, in the Old Testament. These are just two that I picked. But it's the Old Testament that teaches us well ahead of medicine practice that we're to wash our hands and our clothes in running water in order to clean them. That, that human waste is to be buried outside or away from the people so it doesn't cause disease within the camp. The Old Testament teaches that life begins at conception you know, something else that science has come around to discover in the last few years. So that's interesting and compelling, and in my mind that helps us to move towards uh, the idea or the, the fact that these scriptures uh, are inspired by God. Uh, but you know, what do we do with that now? Uh, if we come to accept that these texts and these commandments and laws are inspired by God, if we come to accept that and, and believe that, then what do we do with it now? Well, we should probably obey them, shouldn't we? So let's look real quick at a promise that God made to His people when He gave them this law. Exodus 15 and 26, the text reads, He said, If you listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all of his decrees, God says, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your God who heals you. So here we have a promise from God to protect the Jews from certain diseases. So let me ask you this. Do you think that God just kind of sat on his throne in heaven and every time a Jew was about to get a disease, God would just kind of wave his hand over the earth and just magically, you know, all the Jews were healed. Is that what God did? I don't think that's what God did, and here's why. God said he would not bring on the Jews any of the diseases if what? If they followed his commands. So, so this is what I think God did, that within his commands uh, that he gave them was the wisdom and the knowledge that the Jews needed to stay free of certain diseases. Within God's commands, you know, to do this and to not do that, if Israel would just do what God said, the way God said to, uh, to do it, whether they understood or not, or whether they agreed or not, if they would just keep the word of the Lord as it was given to them, then they would avoid plaguing themselves and their entire nation with certain diseases. So my question for us this morning is that if, if God did that for his people under the old law, do you think that maybe he's done something very similar for us Christians as well. You know, do you think it's possible that God's given us uh, wisdom and knowledge in the New Testament so that when we do it, uh, the world will look at us and say, man, that's the truly wise people. How did they know to do that? The first example I have this morning is um, the excessive use of alcohol. Christians are taught by God in Ephesians 5 and 18 that we're not to get drunk with wine, which can lead to reckless living. 1 Timothy 3 and 3 says for, uh, for an elder to not be addicted to wine. 1 Timothy 3 and 8 for a deacon not to be addicted to much wine. 1 Corinthians 6 and 9 says nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards shall inherit the kingdom of God. And so my question for us this morning is that is it, is it burdensome for us to keep this command? Uh, do we sometimes maybe not see the big deal? Do we sometimes look at God and say, man, God just doesn't want me to have any fun. He, he's a stick in the mud. Because if that's our attitude about God's commandments, I don't think it should be. Because I think we should be ready to keep this command with, with zeal and with thankfulness that we have it because, because God's protecting us with his commandments. Uh, it's for your good that you keep these commandments. Here's why. 
with this one in particular. Chronic use of alcohol contributes to cardiovascular disease. Chronic use of al alcohol can, uh, causes intestinal pain and can lead to frequent diarrhea and stomach pain. Chronic drinkers of alcohol are more likely to develop throat, mouth, and esophageal cancer. There's sexual dysfunction that comes, stems from alcohol, and, and no one wants that. Uh, nerve damage. Numbness, tingling in the hands and feet will result from nerve damage. So, so does God want us to stay away from the excessive use of alcohol because he doesn't want us to have fun on the weekend? No, he's protecting me from dying early from heart disease. Uh, God, is God against the excessive use of alcohol because you know, he's God and this is kind of a power play on his, his end? He gets to make the rules regardless of what we want. I don't think that's his intention. I think he's protecting me. I think he's protecting my brain for, you know, from dehydrating in the short term and then causing me lots of problems in the long term like uh, memory loss and other things that can come from prolonged use of alcohol. So I hope that we're starting to see the point a little bit is that within God's commands, uh, you know, here specifically to avoid excessive alcohol, you know, I get to preserve the mental and the physical capacity of my body. It's a good thing for me to do. Let's look at a second example. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6 and verse 9, uh, Paul writes, Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, or among other things Paul lists, will inherit the kingdom of God. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 8, Paul, um, Paul writes, Nor let us act sexually immoral, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Hebrews 13 and 4 says, <clears throat> Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for fornicators and adult adulterers God will judge. So it's clear from the New Testament that Christians, you know, this is, this is God's will for mankind, but of course it's given for us Christians. He says that uh, Christians can which of course is having sex outside of the marriage covenant. And so my question is, is it a burden for us to keep this command? Do we grumble about it? Do we complain about it? Or do we sometimes flat out disobey it? Uh, because again, we shouldn't. Because remember, as we've been learning this morning, God's commands are intended for our good. Uh, the same way he protected Israel from disease and he wanted them to be healthier and happier than they would otherwise be, he's also protecting us. So let's look at a couple of reasons why. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that uh, I am defiling my own body, uh, of course, when I fornicate, and that it's a temple for the Lord. And, and that word uh, defile means to desecrate or to profane or to make, you know, to make common something that's holy. God's given us these very sophisticated bodies, and they're very, they're very unique from anything else, uh, from a lot of things on earth, and, and we defile this body when we use it in a way that's not appropriate to God. There's, of course, the possibility of an unwanted pregnancy, and unfortunately, this day and time, a lot of unwanted pregnancies end in abortion, and the, the innocent child's life is taken away from it before it even gets to come out of the womb and see the light of day. Uh, there's, the, of course, the possibility of, uh, of contracting an STD or a sexually transmitted uh, disease. Uh, here, this is a few statistics uh, found on the CDC from uh, even just 2014. Uh, th let's see, these are a few different STDs. Uh, chlamydia is up 19% since 2014. Gonorrhea, 63% since 2014. Primary, secondary syphilis up 71% since 2014. And then, of course, the last syphilis up 185%. This is just since 2014. The CDC also says that sexually transmitted infections place a significant economic strain on the U.S. healthcare system. The CDC conservatively estimates that the lifelong cost of treating eight of the most common STIs in just one year is 16, nearly $16 billion. So just think about that for a minute. That's, that's a lot of money. Think about all the other things that our money, our, gov our taxpayer money could be spent on other than, than trying to treat these things on the back end. If we were to look to the New Testament, we would see the cure for STDs. If we were to uh, just follow what God's law is about sex 
and, uh, and, and fornication and adultery, that if we could just listen to those laws, then uh, the generation that follows us would not have this problem. They wouldn't have to deal with STDs. They would leave our, our, uh, our country if we could just follow what God says about these things. And, of course, the next generation would be about $16, rich, $16 billion richer a year. Lastly, in the same idea, there's uh, about fornicating and about disobeying God's commands. There's the, the, you know, the deep emotional connection that uh, is ripped apart when you know, a boyfriend or a girlfriend break up, when they've, when they've done something that God's designed to bring two people close together, uh, and then they split apart. It, it ha it's more painful than it, than it ought to be. Uh, and then, of course, not to mention, you miss out on that experience with the person that you do love when you finally get to marry them. So are you starting to see a pattern here? You know, God says, don't be addicted to much wine. Uh, if, I, if I do this, then I, I keep a clear head and I make good decisions and the mental and, and physical capacities of my body are preserved. Uh, and then if I don't do this, there's the possibility that I'm going to become enslaved to it and over time it's going to destroy my body, which is a good gift from God. When God, God says, don't fornicate, if I obey this command, then I get to experience this, of course, with the love of my life when we get married. Uh, if I don't, then, of course, I'm at risk for an unwanted pregnancy. I'm at risk for contracting an STD, uh, which some in the end will, you know, destroy your body. So, now take this same idea, this, uh, that God's commands are good for us, and, and apply it to any and every command that God's given to us in the New Testament. When God tells us to assemble, when God tells us to sing, when God tells us to give, when God tells us to forgive, when God says don't gossip or don't slander, when He says don't grumble or don't complain, but instead speak wholesome words that build each other up, whether we're aware of the benefits of God's commandments right away or not, uh, we should do them, trusting that they're good for us, looking back to the Old Testament and seeing how Israel's laws and commandments were good for them, even though they might not have fully comprehended what they were doing at the time, we look back on them and say, wow, they were a truly wise people. I think God's doing something very similar for us Christians. If we would just follow God's commands, we wouldn't have to suffer this, some of the same things that the people around us do because we would essentially be wiser and more knowledgeable because we have inspired instructions given to us. So I want to leave you with a final thought this morning, and this is uh, for everyone, not just for Christians. In John 10 and verse 10, Jesus says that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. So when the Bible says that evil comes only with the sole intention to steal and to kill and to take away from you, that's exactly what it means. When the, when the thief comes to steal, he's coming to steal from your life. He, he's coming to steal from your joy. He's coming to steal from your good. All, all the good gifts that God has given us in this life, family and friends, relationships, uh, jobs, ha homes, all these things, evil wants to come and take those things away from you, and it will. If we practice it, it will. I'm sure we've all experienced this to some degree uh, in our own lives uh, or another, uh, that, uh, that sin does detract from God's good gifts that He's given to us. But sin can't do that if we don't practice it. If we don't follow after our own you know, desires and lusts and those things, then the sin can't take away the good things that God has given us because Jesus has said this, John 10 and 10, Jesus says, I came that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I think if we can only start to listen and start to love the words that are found in these pages, uh, I think that we would all be better off for it. Well, thank you, everyone, for, for listening. That's the lesson. I want to offer the invitation this morning. You know, if you're, if you're not a Christian uh, and, you know, you come to the realization uh, that, you know, these scriptures are, in fact, inspired by God and, and you want to know more about them and you want to become a Christian, you know, if you're willing, if you believe that Jesus is, you know, sent from God, sent to this earth to, to die the death on the cross for all of our sins, uh, if you're willing to confess that and, and and, and start turning away from what God says is sin and evil and turning toward what He says is good for us, then you can do that. Uh, if you're ready to make that commitment, 
uh, the water is ready here. You can be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. And then when you come up, you can start living your life for Christ, studying the scriptures, trying to, trying to change yourself and, and uh, you know, be a better example of a true Christian and go into the world and, and teach others. Uh, and then if you are a Christian uh, and maybe you've fallen away or you haven't really studied like you should or you haven't been out making an example uh, like you should, then those things, and you can, you can have forgiveness too this morning. Uh, if there's anything we can do for you, just come and, uh, while we stand and sing.